From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. A day ahead of the midterm elections in the United States, President Donald Trump has rained polls full sanctions against Iran. He called them the most severe sanctions ever. Ma millions of Iranians protested on Sunday against the United States action. The demonstrations also marked the anniversary of the seizure of the U.S. Embassy in 1979. Marchers held banners saying, down with the U.S. and dead to Israel. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani has gone on television to promise that his country will continue to sell oil in spite of the sanctions. The 40-year history of the Islamic Revolution is one of frequent failures by America in Iran and in the region. And with the help of God and the resistance of our people, this last trick of the enemy, which means economic warfare, with remarkable support from the American media against the Iranian nation, will also fail. President Trump has been campaigning across the country in the run-up to Tuesday's elections. On Sunday evening, he was in Georgia, where the Democrat Stacey Abrams is hoping to become the first black woman governor in the history of the United States. Trump called Abrams one of the most extreme far-right, far-left politicians in the country. And once again, he warned that his government will not let the migrant caravan crossing Mexico enter the United States. How about that caravan? Do you want to let that caravan just pour in? I don't think so. In the meantime, you saw, last week I called up the United States military. We're not playing games, folks. There's no game. Because you look at what's marching up, that's an invasion. That's not, that's an invasion. Trump's administration has been reinforcing the southern border since Friday. There are more than 2,000 additional soldiers, helicopters, drones, and barbed wire that are already more than 3,000 National Guard members and could reach to 15,000, the biggest contingent used in decades inside the U.S. Our correspondent in Washington, D.C., Alina Duarte, brings us more. These midterm elections are considered the most important since Donald Trump took office. They have even been labeled as a referendum to Donald Trump's administration. Several subjects have been discussed during his campaign, subjects like immigration. Donald Trump keeps insisting that immigration is a great threat. Nevertheless, he hasn't mentioned yet the damage caused by weapons, carried primarily by U.S. citizens. For instance, the horrible shooting in Las Vegas or the recent tragedy in Pittsburgh. Donald Trump also mentioned in one of his events that the Democratic victory would trigger a socialist movement and the arrival of thousands of Central American criminals to the U.S., referring to the caravan coming from Honduras. In these elections, various positions will be balloted. A total of 36 governors, 35 out of 100 senators, and 435 seats in the Chamber of Representatives. According to the polls, the Republicans are about to lose, but the senators' chamber can be won by the Republicans. Nevertheless, anything can be expected on Tuesday when the midterm elections hit the polls. But despite the negative messages about the migrant caravan from the U.S. administration, many people believe they should be welcome. That is the case of residents in the small Texas border town of San Elisario. People believe that members of the migrant caravan making its way toward the U.S. are hard-working people. Many of the inhabitants also have a migrant background, and they want new migrants to have the chance they had when they arrived to the country. It's not an issue for me for any kind of immigrant coming in because they're humans, we're human too. We, are, we were born and we were taught how to treat them with respect. Also, a balloon that represents Trump as a baby has been launched by political activists in San Diego to reject his policies over migration. The balloon depicts an orange-colored baby Trump dressed with diapers with small hands and an angry face to mock the U.S. president. He is infantile. He is like a toddler when things don't go his way. Do you ever see him get interviewed? And it, it's in some of our most horrific things that have been happening around the world, hurricanes, shootings, bombings, 
He always manages to make it about him. Isn't that funny? Donald Trump has moved the United States, uh, if not into fascism, right up to the point where uh, we're now in a fascist uh, police, uh, police state with threats of more wars. And Guatemala's President Jimmy Morales is in the United States to discuss the migrant caravan. He will visit a migrant shelter which temporarily houses children who have been traveling along in the caravan. He's also going to Honduras to meet President Juan Orlando Hernandez. Morales had also scheduled a visit to El Salvador where he will meet Vice President Oscar Ortiz. Meanwhile, the migrant caravan continued its march to the north. An advanced group from the first caravan has already entered Mexico City. There had been a sports stadium. Others decided to gather in Puebla to rest and to wait for more migrants to arrive. They plan to set off early this, this Monday for Mexico City and at 100 kilometers away. Well, I'm a bit exhausted because of the cold and because we have not eaten. Everything else is going well, thank God. I'm having health, I just have not eaten. What I want to do? Well, help my parents, get them out, give them everything I can. Our correspondent Eduardo Martinez has more on the first caravan. We are here in the community of Ciudad Isla, in the state of Veracruz. Families have gathered here to continue their journey to the state of Córdoba. I want to show you how some families are in desperate need of transportation, which is very hard to find, because not everyone is willing to help them. Still, they are very grateful to those who help them with food, water and clothes. Many people are in need of clothes since it's very difficult to bring luggage with them, mostly because it's difficult to walk for long hours with too much luggage. We will keep you updated as soon as we get more information about this migrant caravan that still has almost 300 kilometers to go. The first caravan has decided to continue moving till the Mexico City. They continue their journey either on foot or hitched for rides in trucks after the governor of Veracruz didn't fulfill his promise of providing 162 buses to carry them. Exhausted from their long walks, these families have decided to push through just carrying the few belongings they brought along from home. We want to arrive to the Mexico City now. It's already been so late. The other caravan will catch up with us. What else can we do? Help and support for them has declined. They have been walking for two weeks already in the Mexican territory, but have hardly covered 740 kilometers. Their desperation is starting to grow. There have been some clashes among the migrants to get a place in trucks in order to reach their next stop faster. Shelters are not enough for the migrant families. The migrants who are traveling alone or with their spouses have decided to leave the caravan and go to Puebla instead. I first think about my children. I don't worry about the time. When we first decided to leave home, I had a date and a fixed time of departure, but there is no destiny in my mind. They know the risk of walking through one of the most violent states of the country. The crime rate of this region has been one of the worst in Mexico with reports of mass killing among other crimes. The second migrant caravan is crossing the state of Chiapas. Our correspondent Pablo Perez is in Hipijapan and tells us more. We are en route between Pijijapa and Ciudad Arriaga in the southern state of Chiapas. It's a particularly treacherous day because of the distance the migrants have to walk today. There are no villages or towns on the way where they could expect some from the local people like food or water. It is a very difficult stretch of their journey. This is one of the hardest moments for them. We have already saw that with the first caravan. And still this second caravan is taking the same route expecting to get a ride from vehicles on the road, and also with the support of people with No Frontiers organization who help children and women to reach as far as possible. They aim for the city of Arriaga, but if not, to reach at least until the town of Tonala. This taking into account that the first caravan is already more than 500 kilometers in ahead of them. It's encouraging for this group because they see the possibility to join them in the Mexico city. So let's look at how the migrant caravans are moving. There are currently four caravans. The first caravan in red 
came from Honduras and has four, more than 4,000 people. The second caravan and third caravans are in yellow and red, came from Guatemala and together have 4,000 people. The fourth caravan in orange comes from El Salvador with more than 1,000 people. They have all reached Mexico now. Mexican people continue to show their solidarity with the migrants. A couple invited a group of Hondurans sheltering their town to their wedding. The Mexican bride and her Honduran groom, who is also a Mexican resident, laid on a treat for the migrants who are temporarily sheltering in their church on their journey to the north. Migrants cheered the couple, sharing their big day. According to the tradition, the bride threw her bouquet, which women from the migrant group tried to catch. We'll take a short break now, more news in a minute. Welcome back. Three Venezuelan soldiers guarding the border with Colombia have been killed after an attack by mili paramilitary forces. Venezuela's Minister of Defense, Vladimir Padrino, explained on Twitter that a dozen more were wounded, including officers. Padrino said this was a payback for capturing nine members of a paramilitary group in the area who were in possession of heavy weapons. A group of 91 Venezuelans have departed the Dominican Republic to return to their country as part of the Venezuelan government's return to the homeland plan. This is the second flight from the Dominican Republic. The returning migrants say they, they wish to work and contribute to the development of Venezuela. I am coming back thanks to the call of President Nicolás Maduro. We are going to work together. I have been here for almost a year and I have had a good time. I am going back after the President's call to work together in building the country and it's worth it. I'm going back because of my family, to see my kids and to continue with what I was doing. For me, Venezuela is something to be proud of. When you're abroad, you value your country much more. Our correspondent in Santo Domingo, Daisy Tucson, has more details. From the International Airport of Las Americas in Santo Domingo, the second flight has taken off from the Dominican Republic as part of the return to the homeland plan. Let's recall that in the months of October, the first flight, which was part of the plan, took off with 90 Venezuelans. The second flight is taking 91 people that sums up to 181 Venezuelans who have left the Dominican Republic in less than two months. The country has worked alongside the Venezuelan government in order to accomplish this. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza has visited Dominica to celebrate its 40th Independence Day. Arreaza has held a bilateral meeting with the Dominican Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt. On November 3, 1978, the Caribbean nation gained its freedom from the British rule and became an independent republic within the Commonwealth. Cuban President Miguel Díaz-Canel has met the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang. North Korean state media has described the visit as an historic event highlighting the friendship between the two nations. The Cuban president is on an international tour to several countries. He already visited Russia and he will continue his tour to China, Vietnam and Laos. Peruvian police has used tear gas against activists during anti-bullfighting protests. Hundreds of animal rights activists have gathered in capital Lima during the country's traditional annual bullfighting fair. The protesters want to push for the outlaw of bullfighting. They argue this practice amounts to legalized torture. No more killings. That is the only thing we want. Stop the killings. These sort of games should not exist. Peru is one of the eight countries which brutally tortures bulls in front of people and which considers it a form of cultural art. Colombia's ombudsman's office has denounced the displacement of almost 800 people, including 250 children in rural, in rural areas of the Department of Santander due to clashes between armed groups. The massive displacement started this Friday from the municipality of Acari as the result of fighting between the National Liberation Army and the Popular Liberation Army. 
The United Nations has also issued an, al an alert linked to the risk of new displacements in the same area. The trial of Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is set to begin this Monday in New York. The alleged head of Mexico's Sinaloa's drug cartel is charged with 17 counts, including murder, drug trafficking and money laundering. El Chapo allegedly led the cartel from 1989 to 2014. Sinaloa's cartel is said to be the largest drug trafficking organization in the world with thousands of members. The trial is expected to last more than four months. Hundreds of Costa Ricans have visited the largest floating bookstore in the world. With over 5,000 books, Logos Hope is dug in the poor city of Punta Arenas and will, uh, will be stationed to the, to the end of the week. Visitors can buy books at prices usually less than two, U two US, US dollars. Logos Hope travels around the world and it visited Costa Rica last time in 2003, rocking over 80,000 visitors. The ship experience seemed very nice, very interesting. The visit I had taught me a lot. Everything they explained, the books that are there. Roger Waters, the co-founder of world-famous band Pink Floyd, has been made an honorary citizen of Uruguay's capital, Montevideo. During his visit, during his visit to the city, he participated in an event to support Palestine. Roger said Israel has never had the intention to allow a Palestinian state. The musician play a concert at the Estadio Centenario. We'll take another short break now. Join us in a few. Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Thursday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Presidential candidates in Madagascar are stepping up their campaign just a few days ahead of the November 7th election. The current president faces two main opponents. The three of them have the, the challenge of convincing voters against abstention in a country engulfed by poverty and corruption. They promise to put the, econo the economy back on track, but many voters dis distrust all the candidates. The African Union has warned about the loss of wildlife in the continent, mainly due to human activities. During a meeting in Rwanda's capital, Kigali, the organization highlighted the importance of em empowering communities around protected areas to adopt sustainable development for both people and animals. It also stressed the importance of promoting strategies against poking and illegal trade. And while storms continue to rage across Italy, at least 12 people have been killed on the island of Sicily, raising the overall dead toll to 29. Among the victims are nine members from the same family who died after an overflowing river flooded their house. Some of the worst hit regions are Trentino and Veneto in northern Italy. In Veneto, where Venice is located, damage could be worth more than a billion US dollars. Ci dispiace per tutto quello che è successo perché siamo sconvolti perché è una tragedia 
che si poteva evitare, non so, volendo il fiume, non, non glielo so dire, purtroppo è successo. E quando succedono queste tragedie, succedono da un momento all'altro, non è che ti dà nessuna avvisaglia, perché fino a ieri pomeriggio qua si stava bene, quindi non, non sappiamo. Mi dispiace tantissimo per queste persone. Hundreds of people in Syria have attended the funeral of a girl killed in a bombing near the Turkish border. Sara Mustafa died in the village of Talfinder, reportedly during a Turkish attack on Kurdish positions. Turkey had already announced that it was planning military operations in the area. Ukrainian anti-corruption activist Katerina Wansuyi has died in hospital three months after being seriously injured in an acid attack. Dozens of people gathered in front of the, of, in front of the Ukrainian Interior Ministry in Kyiv to demand justice. Gansyuk was a city council member of Kherson and an outspoken critic of police corruption. She was attacked in July 2018 by a man who poured a liter of acid over her, over her. Five suspects are in custody. For the first time in Spain, the five main prison unions have, got, have agreed on a six-day strike to fight against the lack of proper worker conditions. According to the unions, the two-day strike in October was very successful. The unions blame the Interior Ministry for withdrawing an economical package offer just two days after proposing it in September. The government had proposed allocation of 140 million US dollars to improve the salaries of the workers. Better salary, better working conditions, and improved security for all of us, interns and workers of prison institutions. This money would increase the average salary of workers to almost 400 US dollars per month in three years, a salary they ask in addition to their present pay. There are huge gaps in salaries in prisons, sometimes as high as 800 US dollars, even when we are doing exactly the same job. In addition, they also denounce privatization of security services and the lack of investment in prisons. They also complain against the government's ignorance against the workers in health and sanitary sectors. There has been a decline in the working conditions in total of 84 Spanish jails. In short, current degradation working conditions in the 84 Spanish prisons. The Spanish penal system would die as we know it because of worsening of public employment and lack of investment in public workers' welfare. This conflict started during the rule of the Popular Party. Then, the PSOE made promises to the unions, but when they came to power, they failed to fulfill their commitments. They are completely silent now. If there is no answer, we will intensify our protests and demonstrations. The workers' union prefer to avoid this confrontation but remain strong in its decision. There are still four days of the strike called for November. They are confident that these strikes will be beneficial not only for the public workers but also to improve the human rights of prisoners. People in New Caledonia have voted in favor of remaining part of France in an independence referendum held this Sunday. Official results say the no vote for independence achieved 56% of the vote share, while the yes side got a 43%. The turnout was 80%. There are, the Pacific Archipelago still has the chance to vote two times more until 2022, after a deal in, two, in 1998 following a violent campaign by separatists belonging to the native Kanak population. The French city of Toulouse has hosted a show in which residents were dropped by a march with giant mechanical creatures. As part of a stunt by the French street theater group, The Machine, dozens of artists operate Ariane, the 13-meter tall spider, and Asterion, the 14-meter high minotaur. The, the creatures are part of the group's Garden of the Temple show and are based on ancient Roman ruins found nearby. We come to the end of this news brief. These and many other stories you can find on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And for our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on the StarSat channel 461 in South Africa and channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.